Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. First and 10, Penn State 32. Sikowski rolls right, gets pressure, dumps it off, and intercepted by Curtis Jacobs. A fabulous play of reading and jumping it. All right, from their own 11 yard line, first and 10, Illinois. Up the middle, hit, and deck for a loss. Fumbles the football, loose on the turf. They scramble at the goal line. The ball is right around the end zone. Now we have to see on the umpire. Who has it and where is it? I think I think Penn State does, in fact, have this. Umpiling. Ellis Brooks is the one who has it. On the field is a recovery by the defense in the end zone. Touchdown. Clifford wants to throw again. Kane picks up the blitz. Near sideline. Goes for Dotson. Adjusts the ball. Makes a spectacular catch. They spin to the ground at the 42 of Illinois. A spectacular play by Jahan Dotson. Back Clifford. Quick slant. He's got Keandre Lambert Smith. Goodbye. Touchdown. Penn State. 42 yards. Penn State blitzes. Hit. Fumbled the ball, hit by Smith, loose on the turf. Devon Ellis is around it at the 25-yard line, and the Nittany Lions get another takeaway. High snap, put down, kick by Stout is up. Kick by Stout is good. Penn State expands its lead to 10 to nothing. Play action, Tarburton's there, and hit, fumbles the football. Picked up by Brisker at the 25, and inside the 25 at the 23. Tarburton hit him, and then Tangelo cleaned him up, and Brisker gets the fumble recovery. Takes the snap, back, pump fakes, hit by Emma Katie, down he goes at the 39-yard line. When they need a sack, they got a sack. It's fourth down. So here it is for Penn State. Fourth and less than one. Warren is the quarterback. Got it. He'll keep it himself left side into the hole. He goes. He's got the first down at the 14-yard line. 31-yard attempt far hash for Jordan Stout. Bristol will snap it. Raphael Checo will put it down. Angle to his right. Puts down. Kick is up. Kick by Stout. He is good. Penn State takes the lead in overtime. 13-10. But now they need a stand. Sikowski turns, it's Brown again. He's decked for a loss at the 21-yard line. Jaquan Brisker, Alice Brooks, and company on the play with Eva Katie. Chris Stoll over the ball. Raphael Checa will put it down, center of the field. Looks back at Stout. They're ready. Put down. Kick is up by Stout. The kick by Jordan Stout is good. We go to a third overtime. Kane up the middle. Kane gets in and ties the game. 18-18. But unfortunately, things went downhill again from there for Penn State. And here we are talking about a historic game, but a historic and monumental loss for the Penn State Nittany Lions. And with that, we bring you, we welcome you in to the Steve Jones Show on this Monday. Macatrillo here with you. Steve will soon be there from the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Humble's Wharf. And online at sunburymotors.com. Ford, Kia, Hyundai, all new pre-owned inventory. All at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Humble's Wharf, and online at sunburymotors.com. And every Monday show is brought to you by our good friends at Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury, or go to purdyinsurance.com, home, auto, life. Hopefully not too many calls about life today after this weekend. RV, boat, all your insurance needs, you go to the pros on Market Street in Sunbury or purdyinsurance.com. And that is a good friends at Purdy Insurance. Now, I, I want to take a different approach to this a little bit. 
in terms of putting out the blame pie with this, certainly a huge chunk goes to James Franklin. Let's just get that out of the way first because you have you had a team that was sleepwalking and did not look ready to play at all. And you continue to have guys when guys get hurt or things don't go or someone's their top player is not playing well, guys don't know how to adjust and step up. Now that works two ways. But as a coaching staff, you got to be able to be prepared for those situations. Now, James Franklin has said in the past, we've talked about this before, how, you know, there's guys, certain guys are making sure they're getting in there with with the reps, with the starters and stuff like that when this came up with Taquan Roberson two weeks ago. But I guess whatever's there is not enough. So you've now seen that happen two weeks in a row two games in a row, I should say, with a bye in between. I expected if anybody had to come into the game for Sean Clifford, which he didn't, he ended up starting, of course, that they'd be looking a little bit more prepared. But then the defensive side of things was a total eye-opener. We're sure we knew P.J. Mustard was going to be a big loss, but you saw some challenges in the Villanova game with the backups after the starters went out when it was 38-3 to and Villanova got some momentum and they made the score a little bit more respectable. Well, that was a big problem Saturday against Illinois. And this is still not a very good team. Now, it's a Big Ten opponent, but this is still not a very good team at all. So, the lack of depth is also something that you have to head toward on the head coach who's recruiting. Now, maybe he'll get better because he has some good recruiting classes coming up in the next two years. In terms of right now, it's not working. However, the players have to find the, have to have the capability to find that mental toughness and step up when they need to. Nobody did that on Saturday with P.J. Mustafer gone. And then offensively, against Iowa... Taquan Roberson comes in, there's eight false start penalties. Now, again, a lot of it was on Taquan Roberson, but still, other guys, everybody has to step up. Guys aren't stepping up, and that was part of the problem, too. Not all of it was on Taquan Roberson. That's what I'm saying. It it, it, it comes to a... Now that I've seen it two weeks, two games in a row, Steve, just guys haven't been able to adjust in game. And I think that's on them rather than the coaching staff, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, you know what? Um... Like, you got to be able to forget about things that happen in the game and, and just move on and keep playing. I felt like they, with, with, with Sean Clifford kind of yeah. struggling a little bit, it just, something was missing, and you needed somebody else to carry the team on their back, and you just didn't get that. Uh, look, you got to be able, first of all, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I really know what happened on Saturday because I kind of sat back and went, I didn't really know what to say about it Um, the uh, because I really don't I really don't know what to say about it to be honest with you Um, I let's start with the basics you've got to be able to win the game up front no matter what now you may throw the say you want to throw the ball 50 times you still need to win the game up front because you need to protect the quarterback right so that's part of winning up front uh, so you've got to be able to either protect or generate the threat of a running game. Um, with um, by winning up front, and Penn State's got to win more battles up front, and it's it's a combination between obviously offensive line tight ends, and also how the running backs handle it. So there's a lot of parts to it that they have to get a better handle on. And and that, that of course, means execution. Uh-oh, you're starting to cut out there. You're, you're playing with the cords again. What are you doing? Don't, don't touch anything. <laughs> 
<laughs> so they tell me on the radio, on the broadcast all the time, Steve, don't touch anything. <laughs> it's like, what? you're an announcer. Don't touch anything. I'm like, okay. All right. And then, of course, to defensively, Illinois did a great job of putting in a package that is uh, is not on any tape anywhere. So, in other words, you have to adjust to this. You got to do it in game. You got you know in halftime, but you got to do it in game, and you got to be able to adjust to it. But seven offensive linemen, two tight ends, is like okay. And Illinois, you could tell what Brett Bielema wanted to do. What he wanted to do was he wanted to shorten the game as much as possible, and they did it. They shortened the game as much as possible. And uh, and when they shortened the game up, they did so by constantly doing a good job of getting yards on first and second down. Because when you see the 9 of 18 on third down, the 9 of 18 on third down, they were 8 of 9 on third down less than 4. But if Penn State could get them off schedule, they were one of nine on third and five or better. And Penn State consistently could not get them off schedule. Now, all that said, Illinois scored one touchdown in the entire game. Right? They scored one. But they controlled the ball for 36 and a half minutes. And they did so with their running game, and they were shorting the game, taking away possessions from Penn State. Smart. And they were able to pull it off. Uh, to their credit. And Penn State, conversely, only had three plays of third down of less than four, and they were consistently, again, in third and long. Um, and the... Um, and so that that's... And they were, they got pressure on Sean. They didn't sack Sean the entire time, but they got pressure on him. You want to at least have the threat of a running game. Yes, a really good running game makes your play action better. But guess what? Teams still run play action even when the you know, sometimes just just like the mere fake of it. You've got guys at least thinking you might run it. That's you know, but it's even better when you're play action on stuff like that. Um, and you just got to be able to win up, you know. It's sometimes this simple about winning the battle up front, but even even at even that aside, you throw the ball down the middle. You've got a guy open. The ball is right. You get the protection. The ball's right there. He drops it. You're like, I mean, the play's going to be a touchdown probably. It's like, oh, okay. You're not getting any. You know, you're not be able to generate anything consistent up the middle. So you go to the outside. Boom. You go to the outside to Dotson. Get the ball into the hands of your best player. And again, I'm not going to mention names. Boom. Misses the block. Boom. Two-yard loss. Where if the block is made, he may go for 15, 20 yards. Uh, So it's that kind of across-the-board execution you've got to be able to get. And then when you get down by the – when they're running the two-point plays, which two-point play do you want them to run? It looked to me like they emptied the bag on them. I mean, they ran the shovel pass. They ran a running play. They threw a pass in the end zone. And then, of course, the best one of all is one they've worked on for weeks. The flip back to Dotson. Boom, he goes to his right. He flips it back to Warren, who's left-handed. Goes to his left. Boom. Well, the problem with the play was, again, you had a breakdown along the way where Warren had to throw with a guy in his face, and he couldn't just make the nice, easy pass to Sean. It would have been easy to and ended it. Like, oh. The whole thing was, it just felt like it, it was a four-hour exercise in futility. And as somebody who's done between football, basketball, and I'll include my time as the third announcer on the network, you know, when I was, you know, all those games I worked as the third announcer on the network in the 80s, early 90s. I've been a part of the Penn State broadcast team in one form or another for over 1,500 games in my career, football and basketball. So if you've heard me say this once, you've heard me say it at a hundred times on this show, and it's based on this experience. When a team is the underdog, the worst thing you can do is give them hope. 
That's why I always talk about playing with the lead. When I mean playing with the lead, I don't mean you're up by three points, you're up by seven points. That's not what I'm talking about. Get to the lead of a couple of scores in the game. All right? Make sure they're never more than two scores. That way you look at them and you have no chance. Because the longer they hang in and they get some confidence, and then the longer they hang in, they get some confidence. And the longer they hang in, all of a sudden they start to think that they can win the game. Even when they were just hanging in, they didn't think they could win the game. But guess what? Now you get to a point where they start to think they can win the game. And then you start to think you might lose the game. And that is, at that, that, that point, you're playing a dangerous game. It's a dangerous game, a very dangerous game. Yeah? You're playing a very dangerous game at that point, and it turned out it was a dangerous game. They didn't win. And it's a game where you force three turnovers and didn't turn it over once. If you were to tell me that Penn State would lose that game in nine overtimes and there were three turnovers in the game, you'd say, well, geez, boy, Penn State turned it over three times. No wonder they lost. Uh Uh-uh, Penn State got the three takeaways, didn't turn over once, still didn't win. Wow. How about that? Think about that. That's how bizarre it was. Are you still playing with the microphone there? See, I can tell you. I can hear all the little clicking sounds, things like that. No, I haven't touched the thing. Don't touch anything. <laughs> That's what everyone tells me, and I don't. Oh, believe me, you don't think Roger and Bob, Steve, don't touch a thing. Just pick up the headset, put it on, don't do anything else. <laughs> <All right>. Okay. <laughs> After meeting them in the Villanova game, yes, I very much know that. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch a thing, Steve. Just don't touch anything. I, mean, I know just enough to get myself on the air here. Actually, I know a little bit more than, but yeah. All right. We need to take a break. We're brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street, and Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. Mark Wogenrich, next half hour on News Radio 1070 WKOK. The weather is getting cooler and the leaves are changing in central PA. Hi, this is Season from Purdy Insurance. If your current agent is falling short, it's time to give Purdy Insurance a call. We're a local, family-owned, independent agency ready to find the right insurance to fit your needs. You can call us at 570-286-5855, stop in our office on Market Street in Sunbury, or head to our website at purdyinsurance.com to find out what we can do for you. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. All right, today's show brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. Auto, home, life, business, motorcycle, boat, whatever it may be. They're the best in the insurance business. Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. We're in the Sunbury Motors studio, Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors, Kia, Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf, online at sunburymotors.com. So I got an email from Doug in Wellsboro, uh, which Matt forwarded to me, asking about whether about people calling in and asking questions on Thursday night. And, of course, that is a Learfield decision. That's not a me or a James or Jack or whatever decision, right? It's been like that for a while. And I, I emailed Doug back, and I said, if anybody's all for it, I am. <laughs> because a, qu- a quarterback club, I asked James questions on Wednesday. And then I get to the Thursday show, and I'm looking around the room like, please, somebody, <laughs> can, can, ask some questions here. Because when the show's done, I then have to do the pregame show with them. I have no idea in a span of 36 hours how many questions I ask him. So, yeah. All right. Now I'm going to ask the questions. We're going to bring in the outstanding Mark Wogenrich from SI.com. Hello, Mark. How have you been? Doing well, Steve. Thanks. Uh, I hate to be the guy on the opposite end of that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I opened the show and I said, geez, Mark, I don't really have a lot of answers. 
um, yeah. <laughs> for, for watching it. I mean, I, I didn't really know what to say, and I thought that was on my part an honest answer. Do you have yeah. something to add to it? I told Matt when he gave me a ring up, he said, uh, yeah, has, has the reaction been from, like, people you're interacting to? I said, they're still in the uh, denial phase, I think, of, of this, you know, kind of bridging between denial and anger. I, The only answer that I really would come up with is um, it's how very simple uh, football ultimately is with uh, with regard to the quarterback position if you have a good strong healthy quarterback who's fit and effective and can make plays you're in really good shape if you have a second you know if you have a backup quarterback you feel really you feel comfortable with who can do most of what your first your number one guy can do you feel really good and it just seems clear that Penn State was not in that position Saturday and uh, I think the point I made was, look, football is also the kind of game, no matter what, even if you are a passing team where teams throw more than ever, winning up front also means pass protection. It's not just the running game. But on both lines of scrimmage, you still have to win uh, there. Is that fair, Mark? Oh, absolutely, most certainly. And it was clear that Penn State really wasn't winning on the offensive line. And their defensive line – Struggled, albeit against you know that um, that thirteen lineman front that Illinois ran <laughs> really effectively. The, you know, as as much you know, as many guys as you put on that offensive line, you still have to be able to figure out a way at least to close some gaps and not have safeties and cornerbacks coming down to, to make a bunch of tackles uh, seven eight yards of And Ultimately, I, I this really begs down for me just offensively because I can go back to the defense as much as you want to say they gave up 357 rushing yards which they did they gave and up gave 10 them, points was, yeah like 300 I think it was 13 plays of maybe 10 plus yard 10 plus yes. rushing yards so it was yes. big gains but Illinois got the red zone twice that I had to go back and look and said is that really true in, in regulation red zone twice that astonished me that you could run for that many yards and that's one that's a testament to again and again and again and again to what George Stout does pinning guys back punting wise but they kept him out of scoring range as, as many yards as they put out there. They kept him out of scoring range, delivered the ball to the offense uh, inside the 25-yard line with an opportunity to score. Didn't come away with any points. Three, t- three turnovers, no. Uh, or three, turno- three points off three turnovers. Kept yeah. him out of the end zone in regulation or in overtime to two um, you know, the standard overtime periods. Defense did its job as much as build those yards they did not break and uh Penn State's offense just Penn State's offense broke um to me that was pretty simple and I don't, I wonder you know whether uh, it would have what it would have looked like um with another quarterback in there with a healthy quarterback in there and that's just like the one of the what if mm-hmm. um questions that you ultimately come around asking after a game like that All right um because yeah, they gave up ten points in the game, yeah, uh, and that was, um, and that ends up being the bottom line. I thought Illinois did a did a great job in what they did by shortening the game. In other words, thirty six and a half minutes, and they mm-hmm. kept Penn State. They reduced Penn State's possessions in the game by how they played it. Yeah, well, was it something like eleven possessions, twelve possessions, something yeah, in regulation? Eleven. I mean, just 11. Didn't, yeah, didn't get it just. Opportunity-wise, yeah, that, that that was one of the issues. But I still think that's a game with that style, the way Illinois is going to play, and the way Penn State did ultimately stop them. You you need to 14 points. I think even going into that game, and I got part of a lot of people on the outside looked at it as like, okay, can you cobble together 14 points um, with your quarterback situation, not knowing um, on Friday or, or you know last week whether Sean Clifford was going to be starting. You think, okay, with the situation, can you build out 14 points with you know, with the quarterbacks you were going to play? And that they didn't trust themselves to be able to do that really, um, you know, really is an internal question that they have to go, uh, you know, not that they haven't addressed it, but it's an internal question that they probably struggled with for the past two weeks. It was one of those games where, I kept thinking midway through the second quarter that if Penn State could get one more score of any kind, 
that would be enough. And the pro- and it turned out that was true. Uh, mm-hmm. But they they never could get that score after you know beyond the middle of the second quarter, and that's like and it allowed Illinois to start believing they had a chance to win. Yeah, and I think to me it was that it was the turnover that yes that did it for me when they got um, Zach Arch- Archisikowski got the fumble got the ball and I thought okay this is the this is the this is that um, sudden change play that Penn State's going to turn into something here they're going to turn it into some sort some kind of points in this game and that is going to be it's going to be ugly but they're going to squeak this one out because they're just um, they are better you know they're a better football team they didn't play as the better football team I think ultimately Illinois deserved to win that game as the better football team that day in executing a game plan that they came in with uh, effectively. But that possession to me, I thought that that was going to be the one. You get the ball to 25, you're going to be able to do something with this, right? You're going to get you're going to get a ball to Jahan Dotson somehow. You're going to get you're going to break something. You're going to hit uh, you know you're going to hit a play like they had hit earlier to Keandre Lambert. But they're going to be able to do something. And not being able to do that, um, that was an alarming moment. And then after that, the cascade of just not being able to really do anything effectively, uh, really, just over a two-game stretch. I went back and counted. They've had one touchdown in 23 regulation regulation possessions since Sean Clifford got hurt. Um, you know, and to go now that you're going to go Ohio State that scored that leads. I think they lead the country in touchdowns. I definitely did. They do. Ten. I think they, they lead the country in touchdowns. The um, that that's a that's a that's a you know it's an alarming task to take on. Uh, look, personnel wise, you're not going to be able to do, you know, it's not, you're not going to be able to come up with mm-hmm. a a different combination, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it comes down to getting what you do and executing it. Yeah. Uh, it, it. I mean, is that safe to say? You know, in terms of the analysis of the team. Yeah, I think I think so. And it's also the pressure that you're putting on the defense to to execute almost at a perfect level. I mean, again, I go back to red zone possessions with all that yardage. So, okay, you had – I mean, Chase Brown was phenomenal and Josh McCray was really good. Mm-hmm. That line, the formation, sure. and everything they did was really good to move the ball downfield on them. But Penn State's defense was, for the most part – Effective in keeping them out of the end zone. They yeah. got to the end zone once until uh, the two point conversion part of overtime. Right. And and you just you keep asking a defense to be perfect, to execute perfectly when your offense is not executing even at an average level. Uh, it's you know that's a game and a half now. Uh, that they've they've kind of foisted that upon the defense, and they just haven't been able to be perfect. They've still been, I think, they've still been really good the last two games. Mm-hmm. Um, the rushing game, notwithstanding, yeah, being uh, you know being not being quite as physical as they could have been, but uh, but still managing a way to get out of out of those situations um, without the points. So mm-hmm. your and now you're going your offense needs to be uh, your offense needs to be just average, uh, I think in that game to win and you can't ask you can't ask that of them at Ohio State. All right, no, you're gonna have to be obviously really good yeah. uh, in in a game like that. Um, mm-hmm. it's, so how do you view? I mean, have you really had a chance to look at Ohio State yet? Obviously, offensively, Stroud's played great. Looks like. The, as an offense, they play great. What's your thought on them? They're at what? They're challenging. The, you know, I think they're on a pace to, to beat the scoring record, that modern kind of Big Ten scoring record that Penn State's 94 offense. So they're averaging 49 right. a game. And you can, I think, four games, less four games at 50 plus, and you can you know, absolutely you can discuss competition and what kind of defenses they faced. And I don't know about. You know, this is going to be the best Big Ten defense that they're going to have played um, right. against so far. But even if even if Penn State is able to cut that in half um, and say, okay, you know, that they put up twenty five, are are as 
are you comfortable enough that Penn State can score 26 um, with the way their offense is functioning uh, right now? I think the defensive matchup with, the, with Penn State's secondary is a pretty good matchup. Yes, yeah. against Ohio State, and I, I look at this with a with a scoring team, you know, with a team that could kind of keep pace and score a little bit. I don't think they're going to stop Penn. I don't think they're going to stop Ohio State clearly, but I, I have a hard time seeing them getting to fifty, even forty necessarily against the Penn State, Penn State defense playing as well uh, as it has for the most part in keeping teams. Uh, out of the end zone. I think it's nine touchdowns that they've allowed this year. I think right. Georgia is the only team better in the country in in, right. in allowing touchdowns. So right. now you've got you know having to do that against Ohio State, who could put up numbers in yards, but if they could keep them out of the end zone, you know half of what they're doing, I think you have a game. It's just yeah. you know circling back. It's a matter of can your offense uh, even approach. Uh, scoring in that range, scoring 25 to 30. What can the threat of a running game mean in a game like this? I'm talking about Penn State's threat yeah. in a running game. I think it's specifically the, is the the threat of a quarterback being able to run a little bit. Um, the, you know, the play that really struck me in that last game with Sean Clifford, he just uh, he was scrambling around a little bit and just and, and slid. Um two yards behind the line of scrimmage and he effectively said you know he's just try it look like he's trying to avoid getting hit contact as a protective measure that's understandable but in that play when he's able to move and run around and with his head still up and looking downfield yeah um, the threat not just to run but then to throw off that run off that scramble before he gets to the line of scrimmage that quarterback draw that he's been effective you know it keeps you know it keeps obviously what Illinois is able to do it's in, in those run blitzes that Penn State had you know trouble handling, and then it also gives you a chance maybe that um, you get a play like they had with Keandre Lambert Smith, where you got a guy checked out of a you know you know Sean checked out of a play saw the single saw that coverage and boom and you can hit your big plays again. They haven't Penn State really has not been able to hit. The big, the big plays in a couple of games. They had that, and then the uh, that kind of jump ball that Jahan Dotson brought down, which I really thought, you know, he took an interception away more than anything. Um, um, that would have been a good. I think that would have been a good play just to knock that ball out of um, out of potentially being intercepted, and he helped me, and then he turned it into a great catch too. Yeah, I the quarterback run is so evident, but at least if you had, I mean, if they had. Uh, the, the threat that they could stretch a running team outside, or you know, break a couple things inside. It's not. It's going to. It's going to give. To me, it's going to free Jahan Dotson. That's probably the biggest thing that I see that he has not been able to do that uh, the last game and a half because they, you know, they don't have Sean as a threat to run, um, and they didn't have really Sean as a threat to kind of get the ball downfield to him either. Okay, my friend, thank you so much for your time. I hope uh, you're, are you going to be in Columbus? Will do, yes. I look forward I'll to look that for, one. Look forward to yeah, seeing we'll you out there, there, my friend. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Mark Wogenrich, SI.com. Come back with a nice story in a moment uh, about, I know you don't want to hear a nice story about Tom Brady because you're a person that you can't stand Tom Brady. <laughs> no, I, I, I can appreciate him now. Now that he's out of New England. I've my hate's gone down a little bit. This is a really nice story. All right, you'll good. like it. You'll like it. Actually, you know what? It. I think I've seen this, but I look forward to hearing it again. Yeah. In a moment, here on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Purdy Insurance. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle's worth. The SMC way is to offer you all 
applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way. The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. Into the end zone. It is caught. Casey Washington's got it. Illinois pulled off the upset. It took nine overtimes. Conversion is confirmed. And Casey Washington catches the game winner from Brandon Peters. And Illinois has pulled off the road upset. That was Saturday. Now, yesterday, Tom Brady became the first quarterback in the history of the NFL to throw 600 touchdowns, right? Touchdown passes. You may have seen at the end of the game, near the end, where I think Tampa Bay's defense was on the field. He walked over to the stands, and he signed a hat for a youngster, and the youngster was in tears. You may not know the story. His name is nine-year-old Noah Reeb. He came to the game with a sign that read, Tom Brady helped me beat brain cancer. 33 seconds to go in the game, he got to meet his hero. Brady approached the youngster, gave him a Tampa Bay Buccaneers crucial catch cap, part of the NFL's month-long campaign to raise cancer awareness, shook his hand. The youngsters from Utah covered his face with his hands, dissolved into tears. Reeves' father, James, wrote on Instagram that it was his son's first NFL game and a dream come true, still hard to believe. Noah was diagnosed in December of 2020 after having severe headaches. It's one of those tragic moments you read about where they turn the screen around and say, you have cancer, uh, Reeb told KS, uh, KSL in Salt Lake City. And in, your, in our case, they turned it around and showed us Noah's tumor in the center of his head said he has brain cancer and we need to get him into the hospital today. He completed his final round of radiation in July and scans showed, thank God, that the tumor was gone. Noah will continue to be monitored until he's the age of 18, so that's eight and a half more years. Brady said, wow, that's really sweet. Obviously, he's a really tough kid. Puts a lot into perspective of what we're doing on the field. In the end, it doesn't mean much compared to what some people have to go through every day. We all try to make a difference in different ways. So, and by the way, the 600th ball for a touchdown, Mike Evans has a habit of throwing it into the stands like he's, because he does it for charity. And so Mike Evans forgot it was the 600th, and he threw it into the stands. <laughs> so, Get the lingerie he, on the deck. He, call the janitor. And so... He came back and went, oh, my God, Tom, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he says, I'll go get it back. And Brady says, I'm sure it's okay. I think they'll figure out a way to get it back. So what the Buccaneers did was they dispatched an official to strike a deal with the fan. They swapped it for a replacement game ball and a $1,000 gift card to the Buccaneers team store, which I think bought two items. Uh, <laughs> so rather than getting okay. I mean, obviously the person could have gotten more for it in the resale market, but. It's nice that they gave it back. Matt would have thrown it back. (laughs) Yeah, he can have it. I mean, you didn't know. You'd have thrown it back. Like, I don't want this. It's like the Yankees fans do. Throw it out. Throw it back. (laughs) That's the 600th. I don't care if it's (laughs) 6,000th. Throw it back. Nice moment. I was. Yes. Watson open to multiple teams. Well, of course he is. Jeez. Yeah, who wouldn't want to leave the Texans right now? I <laughs> mean, yeah, but I mean, do you want him? That I mean, you got you have to inherit. Yeah, you know, as great a talent as he is, you have to inherit all the off the field problems. Exactly, and that's why I would say no. I would say no. Texas Tech firing head coach Matt Wells, 13-14, his record at Texas Tech.